Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dew America. Um, and this talk we have with Josh Chin and Lisa Lin from the Wall Street Journal uh, on Surveillance State, their new book. Um, I'm super excited to host this because um, Josh and I were a uh, longtime colleagues at the Wall Street Journal in China. So for, uh, first things first, a couple of housekeeping rules before we, we get into the meat of the uh, audience. Before we start, uh, if you do have questions during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function and we'll get to them in the second half half of the event. And of course, more importantly, copies of Surveillance State are available for purchase to our book selling partner, Solid State Books. And you can find a link to buy the book on this page. So just click on that. Um, a quick introduction for our two uh, speakers. Josh Chin uh, is a New America Fellow in 2020. He's also the Deputy Bureau Chief in China for Wall Street Journal. As I mentioned, he previously, uh, he and I were previously colleagues there in China, and he has, of course, gone on to do huge, huge things, uh, including leading the investigative team that won the Loeb Awards for international reporting for a series uh, exposing the Chinese government's um, pioneering embrace of digital surveillance. He is also the recipient of the Dan Bowles Medal uh, given to investigative journalists who have exhibited courage in standing up against intimidation. And um, I'd love to ask about that a little bit more in a second. <clears throat> uh, Lisa Lin is, uh, has been covering data use and privacy for the journal from Singapore. And she was also part of the team that won the Loeb in 2018. And prior to that, Lisa spent um, nine years at Bloomberg uh, News and Television too as well. So welcome both of you to this talk. Um, maybe I'll just start first by asking, um, you guys about the how things have changed because when the time when Josh and I were both reporting in China we're talking back in the uh, uh, year 2000s the early stages it was a very different time um, yes we as foreign reporters we were surveilled we were aware that uh, our moves were being watched but at the same time there was a deep awareness at the time that a feeling that with the advent of the internet that this would be a lever that would um, you know pry open the government's uh, control and, and lead to a much more open society society. Um, and that, of course, has was a, a wrong assumption. So how did we go from that kind of uh, utopian view to this decidedly more dystopian view that you present in your book? Yeah, I, um, it is it is remarkable to think back on those times. Um, it, you know, and, and there's that experience, I think a lot of reporters have in China that when when you're there, you think it's the worst it's ever been. And then three or four years go back and you and then some, go by and you suddenly look with nostalgia on the sort of previous period. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, I remember, you know, when I first started interested in China um, and reporting on China I was around uh, when China was entering the WTO in 2001 and Bill Clinton, you know, had to deliver this famous line when he was trying to argue for China's inclusion in the WTO, which was, you know, he said, you know, if, if China joins the WTO, the internet will, you know, will start spreading there and, you know, and, and, um, you know, trying to control the internet is like trying to nail jello to the wall, to right? The wall. <laughs> and so, of course, the Communist Party will never be able to do that. Uh, and eventually, you know, ideas about democracy and freedom and the rule values will spread through China, right? And, and I think a lot of people believe that. I certainly believed it, you know. Um, and I think, uh, and I think China was sort of believed it as well. I mean, I think they were really afraid of the internet. They obviously censored it pretty heavily. Um, but I think there was a kind of uh, there was a turning point in China, probably around sort of 2011, 2012, with the when when social media really started to spread. Um, in China quite widely. And I think that is what really freaked them out. And there were, you know, there were a couple incidents. There's one in particular in 2011 that, it, um, that some people may recall, there was a, a train crash, a, a crash outside of the city of Wenzhou of, the, of China's high speed, you know, new high speed rail. And this had been a, that high speed rail project had been a symbol of kind of China's advancement as a country. And then after the crash, it became a, became a symbol of China, uh, of kind of the communist party, um, of, of, of economic growth run amok and of corruption and of all these other problems in China. And there, it was a huge explosion of, of public anger that I think caught the China's leaders off guard. And it was right around then when you start to see them really get serious about using technology to go switching from offense or from defense to offense, right? Using technology to exert control rather than, um, than erode it. 
Oh, what about you? Yeah. When was the clicking point for you when you realized that this was absolutely taking a turn for the worse? So I, I think I would describe like the changes that happened after you left me uh, in three buckets. Firstly, the tech innovation, and secondly, legal changes, and then thirdly, just a cultural shift. Um, I'll start with the last one. I, I think at the beginning of 2010, you started seeing smartphones really start to flood the Chinese market. And along with the smartphones began a shift in Chinese society to live their lives entirely on the phone. So everyone was chatting on the phone, on chat messenger. They were buying stuff off e-commerce using their phone. They were using their phone to map out where they were going places or where they frequented, you know, leaving reviews. All that leaves a digital data trail that's very, very much easier for the government to track. So that was already like one step. And then the second step that really aided this was the tech innovation. Right, and the tech innovation I talk about is not just the mobile phone, but like tech breakthroughs in deep learning and AI, which are allowing companies like Tencent, which is China's largest social media company, to essentially monitor messages that are sent from you know you and I if we were using that chat messenger. So they would be able to do not just voice recognition because you can send a voice chat, but you could do um, character recognition. So Tencent actually the AI that's censoring your chats or monitoring your chats knows exactly what you're talking about. Even if there's no human behind it, there's a machine. And the final bucket is really law. You know, after you left me, like there were tons of new laws coming out, just tightening like the government's control on what could be said and how much um, influence they had over tech companies. For example, the internet law would force internet companies to turn over terrorist material or potential national security threats to the government. And they had to do it voluntarily. You know, it wasn't something retrospective um, where the government could go, go to them for data. So it was just like bits and bobs like that that has just generally made this environment a lot more tense and a lot more controlled. Well, I definitely uh, feel that, uh, uh, you know, I definitely agree in the last part, particularly on the cultural issue. Um, I, re I remember at the time when I was covering the dawn event of, of credit card companies and things, we were like, oh, no, credit, China's such a low credit society. This e-commerce thing will have all sorts of barriers to it. And now everybody has a quick QR code. You can't practically even use cash in China. Be, you know, even beggars have QR codes now. They won't even take cash, right? That's the, that's the, the story there. But um, one of the things that really, uh, struck me as really interesting in a book that I was personally very interested in was the issue with your stories about the uh, sort of the origins of harnessing technology for digital control. And some of this has, um, you know, uh, linkages for our American audience or American audience particularly. Um, and this centers around the figure of Chen Shish and the, um, these uh, very brilliant scientists who was one of the founders, I think, of the Jet Propulsion Lab, like Cal Caltech has. And during the McCarthy era, um, you know, where he was accused of being a spy, he he was basically so uh, turned off that he went back to China, which I think some uh, intelligence officers in the U.S. said was the greatest mistake of the time. But what Chen did was take his genius and brilliance and use it to apply to the issue of cybernetics and the, the idea of being able to use technology to uh, for to harness for desirable behavior in society. And what we saw some of that happening with some of his proteges in a very early stage was with the one child policy, where the idea was to control and curate technology and surveillance to control uh, people's desire to have children and families. And that has obviously got a long sway. But of course, at that time, 30 years ago, there was simply not that level of uh, ability to control to the to where it is now. So can you talk a little bit about how Chen and, and, and this whole concept of cybernetics and social control and technology uh, has blossomed forth, which is what you, you talk about in your book so fascinatingly? Right. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought up Chen May because Chen Shui Shen, he's, I mean, he's one of these characters who really speaks to um, just the sort of the depth of the connections between China and the U.S. Uh, when it comes to all of this sort of stuff. Right. And, you know, I mean, Chen, he was one of these, um, he was a sort of genius uh, Chinese engineer who who went to the U.S. very early on, on a U.S. government funded scholarship and like, and started to build China's or the U.S. rocket program in conjunction with, with Theodore von Karman and, and a few other people. Uh, and 
you know, for all intents and purposes, it seems like he really wanted to be an American. Uh, it's, and he had, had applied for U.S. citizenship before uh, he was chased back to China in the McCarthy era. Um, and there are obviously parallels today uh, with, with with Chinese scientists in the U.S. now. But um, yeah, you know, he one of the things that he did when he was he was under FBI surveillance for several years in Los Angeles and sort of couldn't work. And and what he did during that time was sort of sit in his study in his house in L.A. and read books. And one of the books he read was by an American um, mathematician named Norbert Wiener called Cybernetics, right? And it was this book that was sort of basically created this whole field um, that was extremely just revolutionary at the time uh, that examined how, essentially how you use information to exert control, right? And this, you know, it's very broad and it kind of applies to everything from sort of human beings and animals all the way to sort of mechanical systems, right? And Chen used these, these insights to, to kind of create a whole new approach to engineering, which he first used in missiles. Um, he sort of helped build China's missile system. But then he also, um, he was extremely ambitious and he wanted to use these systems to apply to society, right? And so he sort of developed, you know, Norbert Wiener, the, the, the founder of cybernetics was very skeptical that you could use this to, to these ideas to control society, but, but Chen Shui-sen disagreed. Uh, and felt like you could. Um, so one of the first things he did, which was totally disastrous, was um, was advise. He, he wrote a paper during the Great Leap Forward um, in the 1950s in China, where he 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 predicted um, with basically zero knowledge of agriculture that that China could ra could exponentially increase its farm output. Um, and a lot of people blame him partially for that because they think that he convinced Mao to kind of go ahead with this. This sort of disastrous um, agricultural policy that led to famine, and then yes, his protege uh, oh, Song yeah. Jian um, used those ideas to push the one-child policy, which you which you wrote about so brilliantly in your in your fantastic book. Um, but you're right. So that, so for a long time, the the these ideas about engineering society, they kind of after especially after the, the one-child policy, they kind of hovered in the background. You know, they were. They're kind of being taught in the party school and, 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 you know, the central party school in Beijing and communist party officials were sort of being steeped in this idea of systematic thinking, right, of thinking of, of, of society in terms of engineering problems, but they never really had the tools to kind of implement it. Um, and so as Lisa, as Lisa sort of alluded to, one of the big shifts here is that, you know, with, with advances in AI sort of around 2010, especially in deep learning, um, which is a, which is a phrase I'm sure uh, people are familiar with, you know, it was, it became possible to teach machines to sort of learn like human beings by feeding them huge amounts of data. Right. And that was just, it was one of these just critical technological advances that allowed China, the Chinese communist party, which has access to huge amounts of data to, to really start um, trying to engineer society in ways that Chen Shui-sen uh, had, had promoted. Um, and the idea is, you know, to kind of make it like a machine, like a self-guided missile, right? You know, like that, that, that corrects its own path, but like that sort of, that doesn't really actually need that much effort to right. control. So, and so let's move on to talk about where this was really applied for, you know, it, 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 for the first time with disastrous efforts or uh, effects on human rights. Uh, and this was with Xinjiang, right? Xinjiang was really the lab at which uh, the big question of now you have these big ideas about social control using technology, and now you also have the tools with deep learning and AI. And then uh, Beijing sees as a problem what they see as the separatist uh, tendencies with, uh, with the Xinjiang province, where you have a very large uh, Turkic Uyghur Muslim population. Uh, and so they start applying this. Uh, why don't you talk about how you unravel this uh, with your book? Who are, how, what, what, what sets off this uh, spark in your thinking where you start saying, hang on a minute, this, yeah. this is really getting to be a huge issue. Right, right. So, you know, so we, um, um, so we did this, this investigative series into, into surveillance, into surveillance in China in 2017, Lisa and I started it, right. And at the end of, at the end of 2017, we were hearing stories from people about, they're like, oh, you know, people were coming back from trips to Xinjiang and they were saying, oh, you know, this, this technology you're writing about is everywhere there. You really you should check it out. Um, at the time, really no one, no one was really talking that much about Xinjiang and no one was quite aware of what was happening there. Uh, so we didn't know what we were getting into, but you know, a colleague and I drove a, drove a car in and into into Xinjiang, and it was just what we discovered was just, just mind blowing, right? I mean, it was you know I've 
you know, I've been a journalist for many, many years at that point and was, you know, rarely shocked, um, you know, often surprised, but rarely shocked by things that I'd seen there. And this was just utterly, utterly shocking. Right. And, and, you know, what it was, what we discovered was they, you know, they had essentially blanketed the entire region in these technologies to the point where if you're a Uyghur living in Xinjiang, your entire daily existence is is recorded and tracked and analyzed, you know, from the minute you leave your door, actually probably before you leave your door. Um, and, you know, so like if you wanted to go to a bank or a market uh, or a hotel, you would have to, you would have to scan, you have to go through a security gate that would scan your face and compare it to your ID and, and sort of note where you were going. And if you had done something wrong, uh, like we met a guy who had failed to pay his phone bills for a few months. Um, and every time he went through a security gate, an alarm would go off and he wouldn't be allowed to pass through. Um, so he's, he was essentially imprisoned in his neighborhood because of an, an over an unpaid phone bill. Um, you know, and they were collecting biometric data, fingerprints, DNA, voice prints. They were making 3D images of people's heads so they could be tracked by facial recognition cameras wherever they went. Um, one thing that we, you know, we had read about before we went to, you know, was that we didn't really believe was that they were in some places in Xinjiang, they were, um, if you bought a, a knife uh, as a Uyghur, you would have to have your, all of your personal information sort of laser etched into the knife in the form of a QR code. And then we just thought that was like ridiculous. But then we, lo and behold, we went to this town and, and went into a knife shop and it was, and it was true. So, you know, and the, the end goal of all this tracking was to, sniff out Uyghurs who, according to, you know, calculations we don't really understand, um, are seen as potentially threatening to the Communist Party in the future, right? Not people who've committed crimes, not people who've done anything wrong, right? But people whose who sort of daily behavior is, is, is suggests they might someday resist the Communist Party. And then sending those people to this network of, of internment camps, right? Um, and that was the, that was the second really shocking thing was you had this sort of 21st century uh, surveillance technology being married with this 20th century institution that I don't think anyone ever thought would be coming back, right? You know, sort of mass incarceration of religious minorities, right? Um, and so that was just totally shocking. And I think at that point, you know, it was just clear that we would need that what was happening there was really new um, and really significant and that we needed a book to sort of uh, fully unpack what was happening. Right. And um, I can imagine that, I mean, and, and all these um, repressions have been, you know, rightly from the time that you started reporting on the, and many other organizations, nonprofits, and some of my very colleagues too, at Human Rights Watch, like Maya Wong and Sophie Richardson have been uh, documenting, um, have now in some sense, it feels, it feels like some, some form of validation, perhaps in a way that there was a recent uh, UN report on this that sort of, you know, that's, uh, that did confirm that these are, you know, quite uh, lightly crimes against humanity, which is what we at Human Rights Watch have said. But that said, this process of documenting, writing about this comes at terrific cost, uh, not just to, unfortunately, to the to, to the millions who are incarcerated in reality, but also for uh, those of you reporting on it. Both of you are no longer, uh, I think, a sort of persona non grata in China, I take it. You were bounced out. Um, and even the process, I imagine, of going to report this, you know, in a very Soviet country must have been hideously difficult. So maybe um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. And I think our readers would too. Um, what did this mean? What was the cost involved? How did you even get to go places, uh, you know, without having your car pulled over, your, 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 your people that you'd just spoken to five minutes before interrogated? How did that all work? How did you operate? Yeah, that was a that was a real challenge. I mean, that's actually one of the reasons we drove in uh, rather than fly, uh, fly in because we figured the airport would be crawling with with even more surveillance. Um, but actually, uh, while we were driving around, it's funny you mentioned not getting or getting pulled over. You know, one instance I remember just very clearly uh, was my colleague and I at the time we were driving and we just sort of we had been lost and uh, we were on some sort of dirt road trying to find our way back to a highway like in the middle of nowhere in Xinjiang, which is, a, which, you know, is a really vast kind of rural empty place. Right. And um, then all of a sudden we were just, we were surrounded by this cloud of dust. And, uh, and when it cleared, we saw up ahead of us, a police car blocking the road. Uh, so we, so we screeched to a stop and we looked behind us and we saw a police car pulling in behind us. We were trapped on this road and all, and you know, all of these, 
police poured out of the cars are wearing sort of SWAT gear and carrying assault rifles. And they ordered us out of our car and started interrogating us about what we were doing there and why. And, and, um, which was just, just terrifying. Right. And then, and, you know, we finally did manage to kind of talk our way out of it and persuaded them that we were moving along and they could, they didn't have to worry about us. But, you know, before I, before we left, I was like, I turned to one of them and I was like, how did you even find us? There's like nothing out here. And, uh, and the guy was like, Oh, we had some cameras back there that automatically identified your license plate and told us and, and, and alerted us. And so that's why we rushed out here. So, you know, it's just, I mean, it just really brought home to me, like how difficult it is to, to move, just to move around in, in Xinjiang. Um, and, you know, it was, it was, it was strange at the time in Xinjiang. I don't think people really thought that what was happening there was wrong, like Han Chinese people, right? The people sort of carrying this out who were responsible for implementing this system that I don't think they, they thought it was a good thing. I mean, they were sort of like, they felt like this was a new way to, to get tight, to, to exercise tighter control over Xinjiang. And they were sort of, you know, enamored of the technology. So a lot of them were actually willing to, to talk about it, uh, at least initially, um, you know, but talking to Uyghurs was, was, was very difficult, right? And that partly it was difficult because we didn't want to get them in trouble. And we had no idea, you know, um, at the time. I mean, now it's, it's very clear that as a foreigner to be seen t- speaking with a Uyghur is, is, you know, extremely dangerous for the Uyghur. At the time we weren't sure, but we, you know, we had to be extra cautious. And so, yeah, we would sort of try to catch, you know, we would try to interview people in like snatches of conversation, you know, in like in alleyways or places where it couldn't be seen or in cars and, and, and stuff like that. And it was just, um, it made it, it did make it very difficult to do that kind of reporting. Um, and, but it was amazing just how brave, I mean, just ex- extremely brave Uyghurs were in, in, in being willing to like take us aside and tell us what was happening. Yes, there's one particular um, family that you you profile, um, Tamed, right? Um, a filmmaker, Uyghur filmmaker, and his family, and, and his story is a particularly compelling one for the book. Um, and I'd love to ask you a little bit more about that in one second, but I also wanted to give Liza a chance to talk about her wonderful experiences too in this realm. So Liza, tell us, I mean, what was the personal cost to you of, of reporting on this? You... So I definitely uh, had an easier time than Josh, with respect to the book, uh, on a day-to-day basis, working for the Wall Street Journal, you do realize your phone and your WeChat, which is the dominant chat messenger in China, you realize that that's compromised because you sometimes call people who, and, and you're working on a sensitive story and you realize that, you know, after talking for like a minute or two, um, there's like a cross line, right? You hear someone else's conversation and the other person can't hear you and you can't hear them you can't hear her um, and, and you know that it's the AI that's at work because the AI has probably picked up that you're talking about certain sensitive terms to the Chinese government and you know they're actively trying to make sure that you, you both are not uh, continuing the conversation and, and often the cross line gets so bad that you can't. Uh, and you can try, but if you keep trying, then you just get cut. So it, it's like day-to-day experiences like this that make me realize that, okay, even though now we're, we're reporting on China from outside of China, we're still not safe. And like, I've heard from sources as well that when I try to call them with my Chinese mobile number, it turns out as you know, a message that says, this is a fraudulent number. This number has been known to be linked to a scam. Do not pick up. Um, so it, it, it is very difficult. It, it heightens the challenge of being able to talk to people in China. Um, and, and very commonly, if you're working on a sensitive topic, uh, when, when you talk to these, when you talk to your sources, they're petrified themselves. You know, they ask you not to email them. And there's often a different form of correspondence that we use that's not a Chinese-based chat messenger. And typically, like increasingly so in the last year or two, everyone wants to talk on background only. Rarely do they want to put their name on record. Yeah, so, so that's actually like more of reporting on uh, with the Wall Street Journal. With this surveillance state book, I, I actually had an easier time because uh, Josh and I, when, when we started digging into the surveillance state in China, we discovered that it, it, the same camera systems and the same kind of surveillance technologies that were used in Xinjiang in very nefarious and sinister ways were used in very, in, in other ways in other Chinese cities, wealthier Chinese cities, all Han Chinese cities, in ways that residents found very attractive and alluring. Uh, 
So in that in that case, actually, we had unprecedented access to like a law and order unit in Hangzhou, which yeah. we would have never gotten. Yeah, <laughs> not, yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Uh, because they struck me as being so astonishingly open. <laughs> uh, they, um, what, you want to quickly describe what it is for our readers so that they want to read your book even more? <laughs> Sure. So, so for some context, um, typical what we realized was China had like a proliferation of smart cities, and every city wanted to use the latest technology to digitize governance or like to make the city city services just more efficient. Um, and and we 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 honed in on one particular city, Hangzhou, which is not, not as well known as its neighbor, Shanghai, but it's two hours from Shanghai and it's actually home to the tech Alibaba. company, Alibaba. Alibaba, and it's also home to the world's largest camera maker, Hikvision. Mm -hmm. And before that reason, Hangzhou is just very embracing of this sort of technology to do everything from keeping their streets clean to discovering people of interest on the street. Um, so, so the city actually has this, systems that were built by CETC. And for some background, CETC is the same kind of Chinese defense contractor that makes a lot of the surveillance systems in Xinjiang. So the same surveillance systems in Xinjiang that were used to spot Uyghurs uh, were actually used to pick out people of interest to the Hangzhou city police in Hangzhou itself. And, and these would be like criminals, on you know, fugitives, uh, or it would be drug pushers that they had their faces on the list. Uh, generally people that you don't want to see on the streets anyway. So uh, systems like these were very attractive, but, but I, let me maybe perhaps talk a little bit about the law and order unit that I visited and we had unpre unprecedented access to. Uh, I, I found a district in Hangzhou in which um, the Hangzhou Chengguan, and the Chengguan are like junior varsity police in China. They are essentially like when taking when care of small them. things, right? Like littering, vandalism, <laughs> that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not in charge of arresting criminals, but what they're in charge of is keeping the streets clean of trash piles. Or if there's like a car illegally parked on the sidewalk or a street hawker without a license, it is like the Chengguan's yeah, prerogative. widely hated. <laughs> yes, yeah. and they're notorious in China because everyone doesn't like the Chengguan. Uh, they don't have the same power as the police, but try and act like the police. So they end up really coming off as big bullies. Um, and, and the Chengguan was the one in Hangzhou that invited me to take a look at their system. The system was called City Eye. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I first got to the building, it's very nondescript. Think about any, you know, any ordinary boxy communist looking kind of beige building that you see in, in, in Chinese second tier cities. Um, it was very nondescript on the outside, but inside what was happening was really fascinating. There was like, Why when I was brought in, the, <laughs> yes, it was a wall full of plasma TVs and there was streaming, streaming footage from the street, from the entrances of schools, from the entrances of hospitals, like cameras focused on sidewalks, you know, everything was being streamed in real time. And the, the leader of this Chengguan unit was so proud of the system's effectiveness that he welcomed me in. And that was the reason why he wanted to talk to me about it because th that system that they installed two years ago had helped them actually reduce the number of street hawkers, um, like unlicensed street hawkers, almost close to zero. And most like the streets were very, very clean in that neighborhood. Like you didn't see trash piles, you know, e-scooters weren't like strewn all over the sidewalk. So he was very, very proud of the system. Um, and the best part he said was, you know, like we mentioned earlier, the Chengguan are very notorious and did not like. He said the system helped to smooth out relations between the Chengguan and the local residents because the Chengguan, what the system did was it, it has um, cameras uh, facing the street. And whenever the camera spots something abnormal, it takes a picture. It uses image recognition to spot what's abnormal, takes a picture, and then it gets sent to the Chengguan. And the Chengguan will go down and show the offender, like, this is what happened, and can you clean it up? In the past, there would be a lot of, like, tussle because the person who did it would not want to admit he did it. But with the cameras, you know, it's very transparent. There's nothing to hide. Great. I'm going to take a moment at this juncture to remind our audience to send in some questions, which I'm sure you have. Um, but then let me flip this back quickly, because 
it is this utopian view of you know technology that pre- creates a perfect society well or a pretty nice much nicer society technology will make it so that we're not our streets are not jammed with uh, cars uh, uh not littered with pollution that's the utopian view and that's um what i love about your book is how you join the dots and this is not just a purely china book but it's talking about how those technologies are now being actively marketed and used in many parts of the world so can you talk a little bit about that and both the the good side and um as we've talked about some of the more dystopian views on that one yeah i think that's the um i mean that was that was one of the, the sort of big big revelations for us when we were looking at this is that is that that vision right that this is it is not merely you know what's different about what china is doing compared to say like the stasi in east germany right is offering a you know carrots as well as sticks right like the stasi only wanted to control and, and sort of uh, sniff out and, and eradicate dissidents, right? And China definitely wants to do that and is doing that. But they also, uh, yeah, they have, they're offering the sort of more convenient, uh, more secure, predictable life uh, for the for people who who do agree, right? Who do, who, who are willing to behave. Um, and they are selling these systems globally, right? Uh, and that, and, and the vision along with it, yeah, um, I think you mentioned at that time, and I remember reading in the book that the only places where they haven't sold us, the two continents are what, um, Antarctica and Australia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, so, so they're everywhere now. Uh, so my big question to you, therefore, is, you know, is there more carrot and less stick? Because, you know, let's face it, there's also carrot and stick depending on who, for a te- uh, for autocratic regime, yes, wonderful carrot. Uh, for people under that autocratic regime, maybe stick, right? So... It, well, from what you've seen, and you you give a very compelling case study with what happened in Uganda, which was clearly right. much more of a stick issue. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I think the stick function of the system is more uh, fully realized than the carrot function. Um, and, and, and in some ways it doesn't, you know, um, yeah, I mean, that's just because it's always been that way. And and you see this in Uganda. So we, we traveled there. Um, Actually, this the, the Wall Street. This is originally a, a sort of Wall Street Journal story, and um, and we had gone to Uganda, where um, the leader uh, there, Yori Museveni, uh, who's a, a longtime strongman, although a, a, also a longtime recipient of U.S. aid, um, was facing this new challenger, uh, this this sort of pop singer named Bobby Wine, who's sort of young and really charming, and had sort of rallied the the. Um, you know, poor, poor youth in the country who sort of felt um, left out. Uh, and he had really succeeded in, in sort of drumming up a lot of opposition to, to Museveni. And, uh, and so Museveni was looking for ways to deal with this. And he ended up turning to Huawei, which is, um, I think most people know this, that name by now, but it's, a, you know, it's China's largest telecom equipment maker. Um, it builds, uh, you know, telecom systems around the world and including in Africa, uh, and uh, and and sort of said, what what can I do? How, like, how do I, you know, do you have anything for me here, right? And um, he also, you know, also brought in the 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 Chinese ambassador at the time and and was discussing it with him, and and so the the Chinese embassy and Huawei together, they they flew Ugandan police out to China. Took them to Huawei headquarters, of course, and then, but then, you know, took them to the Ministry of Public Security's gigantic headquarters on the on the sort of on the edge of Tiananmen Square, where they kind of ran them through all the ways that China uses its its new surveillance systems to sort of maintain control, right, and to and to sort of sniff out opposition. Um, so the Uganda police, when they got back to Kampala. Uh, a short time later, um, the Ugandan government had signed a, a deal for, I think it was $127 million for a little kind of Chinese surveillance state starter kit um, that Museveni rolled out and, and used to, in the last election, um, used successfully to track down uh, a lot of Bobby Wine supporters and basically neutralize them um, and, and then emerge victorious in the, in the latest elections. Well, um... So maybe uh, I'm going to open this up to questions in a few minutes, but um, to, along those lines, I mean, so the big question here is, and you, and what I like about your book is also it's, it doesn't sort of paint such a, it tries to be very balanced, which is an answer to the big question here is, 
has China really successfully used surveillance to for social control? And you've talked about some areas where it's been successful, but you've also talked about some flaws where this model maybe doesn't always work, and particularly not in for for some for export either. So um, I think particularly Liza, you talked about it quite a bit. So I'd love to hear your. Um, could you explain what what how how this works? Sure. Yeah. And, and maybe let me talk about another interesting finding um, from our research as well. When we looked into the export of such models overseas, we, we found that the export of such models was largely apolitical. Like the Chinese government was selling these systems, but they were not trying to, you know, push a certain, like they're not trying to push uh, autocracy versus democracy. Essentially, you know, what we were finding was they were doing this for two big reasons, which really started to make a lot of sense as we did the research. The first reason they were trying to export and sell the, these models was to validate their own system back home. Because every time you saw um, a Chinese, like, surveillance, Chinese made surveillance system get sold in, particular, particularly in a democratic city or a democratic country, you would see Chinese state media trump it up at home to its own readers saying that, look at China's innovation. We're innovating in, the, in, in governance model. We're innovating in technology. You know, this, this was trumped up as uh, a reason for national pride. And the second reason why um, they really needed this export model to succeed is because, you know, China, as I mentioned, China is home to the world's largest surveillance camera maker, Hikvision, and it's not just home to the biggest surveillance camera maker, it's home to the second and third largest, um, world's largest uh, security camera makers, which is Dahua uh, and Univision. So it's, it's got incentive to keep the export machine humming for these large companies, because if you think about how many cameras there are in China right now, China has close to like more than 400 million cameras, and at some point the demand is going to saturate. And who's going to pick up the demand? They need the export markets to do it. So, so, so these were two reasons why we found like the export, the export of such systems so critical to China and possibly not for like, you know, just because they wanted to push like autocracy, uh, autocratic like ideas overseas. I want to push back against that a little bit because I do think, and quite a lot of people do think as well, that um, there is a, a you know an alternate version of of um, China's um, idea of um, what makes for a, a, a perfect society that it is pushing, which you know it's it's maybe soft power you might define it as such, but it certainly is a, a vision that I think is perhaps somewhat compelling to particularly to um, you know many nations that sort of don't buy into what they see as Western centric ideas. Well, you know, luxurious thoughts about uh, what human rights could be, you know, like here you are, you've done A and now you tell us to do B, but you know, you, you, you've profited off, you know, cutting off your, 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 your woods and stuff, but now you tell us we can't do it. You know, that kind of thinking is, is particularly prevalent. And I, I also find that what was even handed in your book particularly was um, when you look at the uh, involvement of both um, American companies Silicon Valley, um, U.S. government policies into this. This is not just, uh, uh, you know, Beijing's bad, but this is all a tracing forth of some of the involvement of some of the things. And um, since we're coming off very, uh, very soon, a, a week after 9-11, um, uh, I think it's particularly interesting at this point to talk about the juncture of where some of this shaped what we see, what you see today. So right. can you talk a little bit about the role of um, the U.S. and uh, both private and uh, corporate and um, and also government in, in sort of spawning this uh, hyper technology surveillance culture? Yeah, I can. Um, I mean, I think I think. Um, you know this question of what whether China just to just to address that really quickly. Um, you know whether China is 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 pushing its model. I think I mean that is a fascinating debate around all of this, right? And and um, and and it sort of ties back to nine eleven in a lot of ways. But you know I think what China is trying to do is is they're saying if you want to adopt our model, here it is, and like we think it works well, and you can do it. But they're not insisting. They're not sort of attaching. Uh, conditions to those systems, right? They're not saying, you know, the way that sort of the U.S. sometimes attaches conditions to its uh, financial aid, right? China is not saying we will only sell you this technology if you use it in certain ways, right? I think their ideas 
governments can use it to exert control in whatever way they find works best in their country, right? I mean, but the the technologies themselves are sort of built for political control, right? That is, that's kind of how they're they're uh, they're designed. So, um, but nine eleven, you know, um, we did just pass the anniversary, and uh, you know. This is the entire market for digital surveillance, the global market for digital surveillance, um, which includes many countries, including Canada and Israel and Germany, um, was a, a direct consequence of the war on terror, right? I mean, it was just the, the US spending billions of dollars to, 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 to prosecute that war gave rise to just a huge number of, of, of surveillance companies who wanted to, to meet that demand. And, um, and American tech companies obviously were a huge part of that. And they've been a huge part of the, the Chinese surveillance state from the very beginning, right? I mean, going all the way back into the early 2000s when China was trying to figure out how to censor the internet, when, when they were trying to figure out how to nail Jello to the wall, um, you know, they, they, they would hold these security conferences and you would have companies like Cisco Systems, Sun Microsystems, um, Intel, other companies would attend these conferences and, you know, we're trying to sell China the technology to censor and control and monitor the internet. Um, and with the more, with this, this sort of latest evolution in AI driven surveillance, uh, it's the same thing. In, you know, in this case, they're sort of selling um, components, um, you know, they sort of contribute chips, hardware, that sort of thing, um, also capital. So, you know, Intel is, is a good example. They, you know, in, in 2010, they invested in this in this um, startup called NetPosa in China that would go on to be a very, you know, one of the more most important um, companies driving innovation in, in surveillance in China. And they they gave it money, they gave it chips, they gave it advice, and they basically helped build, you know, build it into a, a successful company. And at the time, you know, they they were really kind of openly enthusiastic about how big and potentially profitable the, this this market would be, right? They didn't really hide it. Um, I think at the time, they just, you know, just seemed like a great way to make make some money in China. Good. And it's, and it's not just Intel as well. Um, as part of like research for our book, Josh and I poured through like hundreds of government contracts, government contracts by like Chinese police seeking vendors for such systems. And they would be very specific in what they wanted. You know, they wanted a GPU of a certain like speed. And very often that sort of GPU only comes from American tech companies. And case in point, um, in, in many cases, it was NVIDIA. Uh, so NVIDIA was providing a ton of the chips that were processing, like that were used in the AI applications to process large amounts of, you know, video coming in to recognize these faces. So a lot of the face and image recognition was based on these chips. And it wasn't just the high-end stuff, like low-end stuff, like hard disk drives, because you would need huge amounts of storage space to store all that video. And often like the Chinese police would call for video to be stored for 365 days. So a lot of these hard disk drives came from companies like Seagate and Western Digital. So all in all, I mean, what we found was in the, not regardless of supply chain, commercial or financial partnerships, there was a ton of links between Silicon Valley and the Chinese surveillance state. Yeah, so most of what you're describing here is, and I'm I'm, I'm taking this some of some of the uh, our readers' questions, which I'm uh, I'm also seeing right now here, and so I'm trying to shape them all into a follow up for what what you're describing is, you know, both China and um, U.S. have both sort of claimed the the profit motive as as a big thing. You know, we need uh, more places to buy our stuff. We didn't know uh, if we started policing everything that our stuff was used for, then we'd have no business and we would just die out of existence. Now that kind of argument has, I think. Uh, uh, has been a seismic shift, particularly with the issue of COVID and the pandemic, right? Um, and the awareness that security issues, that the, the, the reliance on self-reliance was particularly. Have you seen a, a shift in that thinking uh, with what, all that's happened recently with the pandemic, with the awareness, with the sort of a fraying of relationship, the U.S.-China relationship? Yeah, I would say, so, um, think... oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Yeah I, yeah, I would say like U.S. companies in the past, maybe, you know, in the early 2000s and even up to like the mid 2010s, they had this naive optimism about China as a market. You know, China was always seen as a source of like very easy and quick profit. And people tended to ignore like the human rights risk to actually selling in the market, right? When you think about like corporate boardrooms, 
shareholders and, and um, directors, the, their questions about China would be like, how fast can you expand there, right? Uh, how can we tap the market? That was the general feel throughout. And you've definitely seen a big shift uh, beginning like with the Trump, uh, the Trump presidency, particularly where US tech company, uh, US companies now are very aware of the regulation risks Mm -hmm. to investing and expanding in China and very aware of the reputational risks should their like product be embroiled in forced labor. So there's definitely been a big, you know, a big change in the way like China has been viewed in the mark, in viewed by companies now. Now the big thinking and the overriding thought is how can we reduce all the different risks to China as opposed to 10 years ago when it was, let's expand at all cost. Let's talk about public awareness. And this question comes from Isabel in the audience, who was wondering if uh, episodes like the recent abuses of health codes in the Hunan banking crisis have changed people's views of these technologies for the worse. Yeah, that's a um, that's been a really fascinating development. I think you know, um, Josh, want to have a quick recap for those of us who don't know what what happened with the Hunan banking crisis? Right. Well, I mean, I, I, we can, yeah. So this was a, this was a situation that happened, um, uh, has been sort of happening over the course of the year. Uh, there was essentially a, a, a group of rural banks that had, uh, that involved had been involved in a fraud and the Chinese government, as they were investigating that fraud, froze all of the, uh, funds in the, in the accounts. And so people who had deposited their money, sometimes their life savings in these accounts got really angry and they, um, and they staged a surprise protest on the steps of the bank regulator in Zhengzhou in the, in the city in Henan province. And, and it really surprised the security officials there. It's very unusual these days for, for people to be able to organize a, a large protest like that. So, so the second time, the, you know, after nothing had happened, the protesters you know, were, were getting prepared to, to, to come back to Zhengzhou. And as they were about to, as they were coming out of the train station, um, you know, in, in in China now, everyone has a health code app, right? That that sort of tracks their exposure to to COVID, and it and it kind of codes you red or green depending on on your on your exposure. And as they were as the protesters were coming out of a train station in Zhengzhou and scanning their way through the security gates, all of their health codes turned red, right? And the and the security folks were there and ready to take them off to a quarantine center, basically prevent the protests from happening. And uh, the reaction to this was really fascinating. And, and to understand, I mean, you kind of have to back up a little bit, you know, that, you know, in the first part of the pandemic, um, you know, people were quite, you know, the pandemic resulted in this huge explosion of of, of surveillance in China, right? Um, in, you know, sort of on a scale that previously people had only seen in, in Xinjiang, where now, um, because of the pandemic, everyone in China is being actively tracked, right? They all have health codes. Um, you know, any city where where there are cases, the you know residential compounds can be locked down, and your your comings and goings can be monitored, or or you could be even prevented from leaving at all. And um, and you know, in the early days, people sort of, sort of accepted it. They were they were ultimately happy with it because they saw the death counts in the United States and elsewhere climbing, and and China, meanwhile, China wasn't experiencing those deaths. Um, but with Zhengzhou, it was interesting. Is 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 it? it became this viral sensation. It just blew up. And there was pu immense public outrage uh, at this idea that, that the government was misusing this technology, right? Um, and uh, and, and as, as a result, the, the head of security in Zhengzhou was fired. A few other officials were fired. Um, the, the health, you know, the health officials, you know, scolded, scolded them for misusing the technology. And it's, so it will be really interesting to, to, you know, going forward to see how this, if that continues, if that outrage sort of continues to boil, because it's, um, you know, certainly one big fear with the pandemic is that the, the government will use these systems for, for other more political purposes. Um, so. So you've certainly answered a bit of the question from um, Jocelyn, who had asked about what was the philosophy that the Chinese government officials say is their reason for these uh, use of this high tech surveillance other than crime reduction. So you've mentioned, obviously, one would be uh, public health reasons, right, to control a pandemic. And certainly with Xinjiang, um, there's terrorism. But one uh, one other reason, uh, and this touches on another question from Jocelyn was um, from the audience was, uh, the use of uh, the relationship of surveillance and com control, uh, control policy to the Chinese anti-gay policy, uh, and they, he, um, and and wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. 
sorry, I didn't catch that, the anti- So in other words, the big question here is, you know, what is the justification for um, Chinese government officials for all these tools of social control? And we've touched on some like, for example, um, prevention of terrorism is their claim um, uh, for health reasons, you know, public health reasons um, uh, for to prevent for social instability. But under it comes some of these issues that um, such as um, anti-gay policy, uh, perhaps, uh, and uh, which, um, you know, one of our readers is asking if you could talk a little bit about right. that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, ultimately, the, what, what what this is all about is is a sort of the Communist Party reinserting itself into the lives of, of Chinese people, right? You know, so for decades they sort of they had pulled back, um, you know, and sort of decided, you know, said let people we'll let people live, lead their lives as long as they don't rebel, right? As long as they don't call for our for, for democracy or whatever, and they sort of were more or less content to let people do whatever, right? Um, and now that you know the party is um, much more interested in kind of telling people how to lead their lives, right? They want they want to they want to engineer a certain kind of society, right? Um, and and it's it's a certain kind of society that I think Xi Jinping has in mind, right? And and that and that's a tough society. That's like a strong. It's a great power society that's sort of capable of standing up to the U.S. and others, and and um, and so you know yeah they've they've definitely targeted the the LGBT community. Um, in Shanghai and elsewhere, they've they've shut down a lot of the WeChat accounts that that um, that community uses. Um, there's some indication that they are surveilling LGBT activists much more active, much more intensely. And a lot of that, you know, comes back to this idea that the LGBT lifestyle, which previously the Communist Party really didn't have. I mean, they they were not they didn't approve, but they also didn't really go out of their way to, to say much about it. It was kind of a don't ask, don't tell approach in a lot of ways, especially, you know, the later years of the Hu Jintao era. Um, that's that's reversed. They don't I don't they don't they sort of actively disapprove now and they're using these tools um, to uh, to express that disapproval. I wonder if someone um, just to add to that. May. Uh, go on. Yeah, sure. I was going to say that the underpinnings of this all um, is also because the party is creating a new social contract for Chinese citizens. In the past, the social contract was always keep us in power, we will deliver like high economic growth and higher incomes, right? And, and now we've seen China, Chinese economies slowing down. The fissures in the economy, like uh, very, you know, like um, the property bubble is finally starting to look like it's going to burst. And because of the zero COVID policy, like economic growth in the last quarter was close to zero. Now that they're struggling to deliver that, they're trying to write a new social contract. And in this new social, social contract, the trade-off would be, let us have your data and we'll keep your streets safe and clean and make your life as frictionless and as easy as possible. So yes, we might not deliver economic growth, but you still have quality of life and improvement there. All this is incredibly fascinating, but somehow also very depressing. So I want to sort of uh, finish, I think, a little bit since we're coming close to that with a uh, hopefully on an, uh, a ho more hopeful note. Now, when whenever I was in China before, we used to have this issue where you would be like, OK, well, a lot of my Chinese friends would be like, what about the US? They're just as equally corrupt and do horrible things. And I would quite frequently say, yes, they do these things too. And, but the, the difference is, if I was reporting this in the US, I could ask these questions and I wouldn't be put in jail. <laughs> That's the difference. Now, in this particular case, when we talk about surveillance policies to which, you know, US government and the US policy and, and US companies are implicated, um, what we see here is perhaps the difference is there has been more, I think, political pushback, uh, more, more, uh, more pushback from NGOs such as my our own and lots of other people, more pushback from the people and and more empowerment in the whole process. Do you are there any particular specific trends in this that you find um, helpful and useful that you're following or watching um, as, as an example of this pushback? And I want to push you at this point because we're time wise to, to keep this uh, pretty short. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're looking for a sort of a hopeful note, you can look to the EU, right? I mean, the big question is for all of us is how do democracies contend with these technologies, right? And, and China has a very clear vision. Democracies don't. Right. Um, the, the EU uh, has a draft law that they're they're considering now that would essentially ban the use of real time surveillance. Um, you know, they've been very strong on that front that they feel very that these technologies are just too disruptive and too powerful and they don't they're not they shouldn't be used in, in that context. 
Um, the U.S. is, you know, a little bit more schizophrenic. Uh, some cities welcome this technology, others don't. You know, one place to look right, I think, to pay a lot of attention to now, if you're interested in this, is California, where they're, you know, they've instituted a lot of bans, um, but they're sort of now rolling them back because of a desire to fight crime. And I think, you know, I think thankfully these issues are going are getting more attention in the U.S. Um, actually, partly because of of the repeal of Roe. Uh, because this is going to really start to affect a lot of women in states where there are abortion bans. And I think that that in and of itself is really frightening. But I think the conversation that it is sparked is encouraging because now people are paying much more attention to it. That's great. Yeah, and actually, uh, no, just, just a quick, quick one. In the UK, there's a code of conduct for surveillance camera use. And there is a surveillance camera commissioner that's independent of the whole ministry that's watching over law enforcement areas, uh, agencies to make sure they're not abusing this. Oh, well, I just wanna close on this point because we're coming to the top of the hour um, to thank you both so much for the work you've done on this and you know, continuing to do on this and for this very fascinating conversation. I wanna thank our audience here for staving with us and encourage them to buy the book if you haven't already. And lastly, I wanna thank New America, particularly the, um, um, both the, the overall um, New America as well as the international security team who also collaborated in putting together this talk and putting it together. Um, uh, so thank you all for coming. Have a great day.